All right. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us on our second blab. Uh, I've got Cobalt Aquatics with me. We've got Les. He's going to uh, be helping us discuss the topic of uh, fish nutrition and uh, basically the general art of feeding fish and um, Cobalt's uh, specific approach to that and why they make their foods the way they do. So, Les, welcome. Thank you for joining me. No problem. Uh, thank you. So, you know, fish nutrition is one of those things that has a lot of people kind of confused or uh, just leaves a lot of questions because there's such a vast variety of foods. Um, not everybody understands why there are so many types of foods or what foods are best for their specific fish or uh, even the most basic thing, how often you feed fish, um, how fish's digestion works in comparison to other uh, creatures on the planet. Uh, so... Why don't you give us just a brief introduction to uh, fish foods and fish feeding, and we'll we'll take it from there and, and see how the conversation unrolls and answer as many questions as we can while they pop up. Okay. Well, uh, fish, you know, there, there's a variety of different types of fish, obviously, from goldfish to zebra daniels to oscars, and each one has their own kind of nutrition that they require, diff different digestive pass and things. So like if you're saying you keep zebra daniels or glowfish, things like that, you really need to be feeding them all the time. Very primitive digestive tract. Uh, but in general, uh, when we talk about fish nutrition, we're, we, unlike say a dog where you want to keep them on the same diet all the time, it's really good to feed a variety of diet to a fish. So when you ask why there's so many different types of foods, that's really to get a lot of that variety out there into the fish. Um, they're, you know, single animal frozen foods all the way to fully prepared flake foods that are available. And each one of them has their kind of unique niche of why they're, why they're important. Um, I would prefer to have people feed a prepared food, a full diet, uh, say a flake or a pellet, because we've taken the, uh, the information and research available and put all the nutrition that the fish needs into one single form factor that's easy for you to feed where a single animal frozen food doesn't necessarily have that so we were talking about proteins uh, amino acids fats uh, vitamins and minerals things like that we make sure that we have all of those things in a prepared food right on so in general um i would say the average aquarius is either dealing with uh, a community tank uh, you know, a cold water, like goldfish tank, um, or something along the lines of uh, a cichlid aquarium or even a predator aquarium. When it comes to, uh, those, uh, tanks, what would you suggest in terms of approach for, for feeding in terms of what kinds of foods and how often, and the amounts for say your average community tank versus goldfish versus cichlids, et cetera. I think, uh, to start off, let's uh, let's look look at say the feed instructions on a can of food. If you look on the back, you know every can's got the instructions, feeding instructions, and it always says feed two to three times a day what the fish will eat in a few minutes. And you know where where in the world does that come from? Um, uh, part of my career, I was actually spent at uh, United Pet Group and Tetra and Marineland and that things, um, and I learned that way back in the day in Tetra, they actually did some studies on how much the average person would take. A pinch of their of their finger uh, when they would feed and put it into the tank. Well, they actually weighed that out and figured out how much people on average would use it. And then they took that information and you go back to actual aquaculture research. And there's a thing called standard methods. And that's a big book of things that you use uh, or for experiments that you do the same every time. And in standard methods for a feed conversion study where you're measuring the amount of food that you put in and the amount of growth that the fish gets on it uh, on it in a certain amount of time from that food, you use the standard method, which is 3% of the total body weight of the fish per day. And so that 3% of weight of food actually correlates to when people take a pinch of food, a flake food, about two to three times a day, what they would eat in several minutes. And so that's where we, where do we get or how much should we feed? Where do we get that from? Those feed instructions, that's where it comes from. From scientific research, standard methods of feeding 3% of the body weight of the animal per day. All right. So it, it basically, when it comes to feeding your fish, if you stick to that, whatever they'll eat in a few minutes, a few times a day, should make up 3% of the fish's total weight. Yes, yes so, on average. So yeah, so basically the fish themselves are kind of helping you uh, out by eating what they're capable of eating in three minutes. Yep. And then also making sure you don't exceed two to three times a day will help prevent issues where food's being uneaten or uh, you're getting excess waste, et cetera. What and fish, 
fish in general are uh, most fish, unless we're talking the bigger predators like Oscars and things that are you know more raptoral and they, they sit there and wait, wait and eat, you know, eat large amounts all at once. And then they can go days without eating. Uh, most fish are in general are constant grazers um, by grazers. I'm not, not necessarily out, just algae eaters, but they're just constantly feeding all day long, every day in the wild. So feeding sporadically over the day is much better than kind of binge feeding for most of the fish as well. So that two to three times a day is more in tune with the way that the fish's natural digestive system is set up. Right. So the, like basically uh, the metabolic rate of the fish for most small species that are going to be in a community tank will benefit from multiple small feedings a day, as opposed to large binge feeding, which actually works better for things like uh, predatory uh, fish like you were mentioning Oscars or uh, ambush predators like wolf fish or frogfish or anything to that effect, which is great. So that really helps because I mean, the most common question we ever get is how much am I supposed to feed my fish? How often? And then what am I supposed to feed my fish? Um, so obviously knowing what your fish's diet is going to be will help you pick the correct food. And uh, your your f- uh, line of food specifically kind of guides you in the right direction. You've got your your tropical flake. Uh, you've got a goldfish specific food. You've got marine specific foods. Uh, how do those foods actually uh, differentiate from one another? Like, what's the difference in in the actual foods themselves, and what's the harm in feeding one food to a different type of fish, and vice versa? So. Each one of our foods is specifically formulated either for a species or for a, a definite diet type that we're shooting for, not necessarily species, but say a herbivore or something like that. Um, and how they vary is with our ingredients that we put in there, the types of proteins and uh, types, uh, the amount of fats that we put in there as well. And then the vitamin mineral complex underneath um, is pretty standard underneath that. But the proteins and fats is where we really vary it. Um, uh, so take, for instance, say goldfish. Goldfish have a very unique digestive system compared to the rest of the the fish out there. Uh, They're really kind of more of a detritivore. You know, they come from carp. So they eat normally kind of rotting plant material typically in the wild, uh, or wild, not really wild, but you know, where they came from originally the carp. And so they, they have a very, uh, simple digestive tract that's used to a lot of roughage. And so we put more uh, plant proteins in that and keep the protein level actually lower on a goldfish food than compared to a standard tropical diet. Um, so that's, if you look at the the GA on the back, we call it the GA, the guaranteed analysis, which is on the back of everything. You can actually see how much protein, how much fat, how much fiber and everything that's in, in the can um, in the food formula right there. And that'll be a really good guide for you. Um, and when we formulate, um, we, we choose our protein specifically depending on the target diet and we mix them between plant, plant and animal proteins. And each one of those proteins actually has uh, different pluses and minuses. So like a animal protein, which is in most cases for us, a salmon meal, uh, the salmon meal has a very good uh, palatability, which means that the, and attractiveness, which means it smells good and the fish want to eat it. Palatability is when the fish will actually take it into their mouth and swallow it. Um, so if they, if they smell it, they'll come up to it and they'll be the attractiveness and they'll come up and look at it. But if they actually consume it, then we consider it palatable. So the salmon meal is a great thing for that. Um, but plant proteins in general, I'm sorry, animal proteins in general compared to plant proteins have a much higher uh, level of nitrogenous waste in relation to the amount of protein the benefit that you get out of there compared to plant proteins. And by nitrogenous waste, I mean uh, the amount of ammonia, the NH3 or NH4 that's it's put out into the into the tank through the passive diffusion through the gills and ammonia is you know a new tank syndrome ammonia to nitrite to nitrate and that eventually will dictate your water qualities your nitrate level so for the amount of we we try to balance uh the amount of animal protein uh for flavor and uh, and palatability with the plant proteins that aren't nearly as much flavor uh, they're not nearly as attractive to most fish um but they, it's good for them because they don't produce as much nitrate or uh, nitrogenous waste. So we balance it and try to make it a good taste and a good uh, protein profile. Um, I like to think of it as if, uh, if you like steak, like I love steak, I'll eat steak anytime. If I smell steak on the barbecue, I go running to look for it. Um, but if I smell Brussels sprouts, I hate those. I go the other way. But if you remember when you're a little kid, you guys, you sat down with a big steak dinner and then the Brussels sprouts came out and your dad's like, you're not getting up off the table until you, 
finish everything on your plate. And then you go in and you chop up the steak into little bits. You chop up the Brussels sprouts and you mix them in just enough so that that's, you can't really taste the Brussels sprouts, but you have to eat it anyway. Uh, that's kind of what we do here with the proteins. We mix the, the good flavor ones along with the better ones that are nutritionally better for them, but we keep them so they're masked so that the fish are still attracted to it. Um, spirulina algae, for instance, great, great ingredient, um, super bitter and almost completely unpalatable to fish. So fish really hate spirulina. They won't go eat it in general. Um, if you just wanted a pure spirulina flake, you would, no fish would touch it. So our spirulina flake, for instance, is a uh, 14% spirulina. And that's where we, we, that's that just enough Brussels sprouts mixed in with the steak, 14% Brussels sprouts, you know, the rest of it steak. That's, that's a spirulina algae at 14%. Right on. So, um, when you're balancing these proteins, the crude protein, uh, that you guys have on the back is going to be a collection of both the animal and plant proteins. Yes, exactly. So even if somebody's saying, looking for a, uh, a sinking wafer for, a, a bottom feeder, like a Pleco that should have technically a, a more vegetable heavy diet or a, a woody diet, depending on the species, just because the protein seems high doesn't necessarily mean that it's animal protein it's potentially going like to be higher in the in the actual uh plant protein yes so, okay. so the, protein, the protein level is just a crude protein level is no, right. there's no there's no uh on, on the way that we are required by law um you guys are up in canada but here our labels are afco american association of feed control officers dictate exactly how we are supposed to label and so the way we label is just crude protein that's it so there's no differentiation in the analysis of that but within the diet if you look on the ingredient list the ingredient list uh on the can the top the first one is the most concentrated all the way down to the least concentrated at the end by law so this is just by weight the smallest amount so you'll see whatever the highest meals are or proteins or whatever is right at the top perfect so that's just an important note because uh in the past i've had customers um saying oh i'm looking for uh, a vegetable based food or uh, a veggie based food for my fish because they need a vegetable diet some cichlids for instance but this seems to have a lot of protein it's important to, to remember that protein comes in both vegetable and meat forms not just one so when you're looking at that label just because it's high in protein doesn't necessarily mean that it's not primarily vegetables or going to be good for your your uh, herbivore uh, fish there's a great uh, great um misnomer out there about protein levels and specifically one type of fish, Trophius. People think, oh my God, I cannot feed Trophius high protein. They'll look at our cichlid flake or our spirulina flake and say, oh my God, it's way too high protein for a Trophius. They'll bloat and they, they'll do horrible on it. Um, behind my little banner here, I have my 265 uh, Tanganyikan tank and I have plenty of Trophius in there and that's all they eat is spirulina and mysis spirulina flake from uh, that we make and they do great. And that, that has a relatively high protein. It's in the forties and uh, people would swear that that's not good for them, but it really, it, the level of protein isn't the problem. It's the type of protein, um, right. so really, really geared towards more vegetables. They're one of the ones that you have to worry about, uh, feeding, say you don't ever want to feed them like blood worms or things like that. They would blow it up instantly. Um, so that there's a prime example of, uh, the right type of protein for the specific type of fish, the protein level really doesn't matter. It just has to be the right one. Right on. So we actually have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to um, look at Reptifin's question here first. Um, he or she is saying that the main ingredient is salmon meal. Is, is that true for all of your foods or is that you just include salmon meal to make sure that it's palatable for the fish? Uh, salmon meal is typically our number one ingredient in okay. all it's our base ingredient. Um, it has a great, not only is it a great protein with all the attractants and palatability, like I mentioned, it also has a very good amino acid profile. And our, our fat component that we use is a, a tuna oil. And when we mix the tuna oil and the salmon meal together, the, the fatty acid and the amino acid profile together of those two are, are great. They're a great pairing. So there are, those are our two base ingredients that we put in all formulas from there, but each formula might have a different level of pro, a level of salmon meal, depending on what we're trying to do with the diet. Uh, but it's, it's our general, our number one ingredient. Okay. Um, awesome. So I appreciate the answer there. We also have another from uh, Melinda O'Donnell. Could you elaborate more on the probiotics in the food and the type of microorganisms? Uh, sure. All of our, Prepared foods um, or dry foods, our flakes and our pellets have uh, probiotic bacteria in there, and they're in there for the digestion. Um, 
and what they do is they get into the gut and we have um, two species that are in there, uh, Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus lichenformis. And they come from aquatic strains uh, that we that we arrived at through aquaculture uh, research. And what they do is once they get into the gut, they're in spore form in, in our foods. And we actually put them right in as, as the spores right into our slurry um, when we're flaking. And it sprays, it goes into the big blender with everything else. And then it sprays on and it dries on the big drum dryer. How, that's how we make flake. And we cook our flake actually shorter times at lower temperatures, specifically to keep those bacteria viable on the, on the food compared to other manufacturers. Um, they have a, a very, they have a terminal temperature where if you cook them too much, they'll just all die. So we have to balance the, the cooking procedure along with the bacteria uh, tolerability to heat. Um, so our, that you'll see that our moisture level is a little different than most, and we don't use um, uh, preservatives either as well because of that, uh, that bacterial component. But once our bacteria get into the food uh, and then into the fish, when, and when they eat it, it takes about two weeks or so for them to really build up into enough population in the gut to become uh, effective. So once you get them on the feed, uh, look for about two weeks. And then after about two weeks, you'll, you'll start to notice a difference in the fish, um, in, typically in the amount of waste they produce because the bacteria actually uh, complement the digestive uh, system of the fish and break the food down in the gut and allow the fish to absorb more nutrition that is being fed to them. So you, you can see um, there's been a couple studies on uh, angelfish and guppies and things. Angelfish is one I remember off the top of my head. Uh, standard sclery angel, uh, you can see up to about a 12% increase in overall biomass on that fish using that feed conversion study that I told you about 3% body weight of feeding right. our exact foods with the bacteria and our exact food without the bacteria. You can see 12% increase in body weight over, over the control with the probiotics in it. Wow. Um, so That's the difference. Yeah. And then because they're absorbing more nutrition, they poop less. So you get less solid waste in the tank. And then the bacteria actually uh, as they get into big numbers, will actually uh, kind of go out with the fecal material and they'll stay on the, the food and they'll break that salt, or I'm sorry, the waste, and they'll break the waste down quicker in the tank as well. So not only do you have less waste, you'll end up having even less solid waste in your gravel when you do maintenance because of them. And the other benefit they provide is uh, competitive exclusion to any sort of gut born pathogen or disease that you might have. So say like trophies or goldfish that tend to get bloat, tend to grow, you know, get that, that bacterial infection that makes them blow it up in their gut. These bacteria through competitive exclusion, which means that there's so many of them in there, they just kind of plug up the system and there isn't enough room for other bacteria to grow that say that might be negative bacteria. They'll keep that bloat from potentially forming. It's not a medication. It's not a cure. If your fish already has bloat, it's probably not going to do much good for it, uh, at, at least in the short term. Um, but if you do, if you have a fish that is, has tendency to get bloat, if you feed it with probiotics, you'll have less of a less of a chance of it developing. Right on. That's fantastic. We've actually got a, another question from uh, Ashish Kumar, um, <laughs> and we got out here too. He's got some cobalt. Food. That's his favorite stuff. It's his favorite, absolute favorite. He's got both of them. So we've got a question. What kind of food is good for a flower horn for it to grow faster? So specifically with growth in uh, uh, hybrid cichlids. Uh, well, if you're just trying to get it to grow really fast and you're not really worried about color, um, our pro breeder formula has uh, is a specifically designed to condition fish for breeding or growth. So it has a very high protein level and high fat level. And the, the formula that's in there is designed to just put weight on a fish quickly. Um, so if that's what you're trying to do, then that's great. But that formula, we don't add any color enhancers to it. There's no extra carotenoids or any astaxanthin, things like that, that enhance the color of fish. So you won't see big sparkling colors from it if you do that. So, um, but if you're just trying to do put weight on quick, uh, the pro breeder. Um, and in the flower horns case or any animal that can handle the pellet, um, pellet is a much denser form factor. And you'll be able to put a lot more food into that fish quicker through a pellet than you can a flake. So I would recommend a pellet and a pro breeder. And if you're trying to get it to color up, then our cichlid formula or our color as a, as an augmentation to that. Right on. So when it comes to color enhancing foods, you, you mentioned uh, two substances, which one, like, first off, when it comes to color enhancing, do you pick a food based on what color you're trying to enhance? Or do you just have like a general food that will enhance all color or how does that exactly work? 
Well, typically when we're talking color enhancing, you're really talking about the uh, reds, orange, and yellows that we can really control through the diet. Uh, typically, the, the blues and the greens are done through crystals in the skull, in the, uh, not the skull, I'm sorry, uh, in the scales and in the tissue. And so they're, they're really hard to augment. Uh, spiruline algae will help a little bit with that, but they're just kind of there. That the fish kind of handles those. But when we're talking reds, oranges, and yellows, we can really, really target the fish uh, with adding carotenoids, um, specifically like beta carotene, and, and there's a few others, and then astaxanthin. And by putting that in, we all of our formulas have at least a little bit in it, except for the pro breeder, um, and our color has about five to six times the amount that we do in our standard flakes. Um, so by feeding that color flake, you're getting a ton more um, astaxanthin specifically. That's the one that, that ingredient's the single most expensive ingredient we put in by pound uh, weight. And we put a lot of it in that one to really make the colors pop. And a little bit goes a long way. Right on. Awesome. So uh, another question that I've, I've had in the past from uh, customers is why it is you should be feeding different foods to your marine fish versus your freshwater fish. So I was hoping you could give us a little bit of insight as to how those fish dif uh, differentiate in diet and why you can't just use like an all-encompassing tropical flake uh, to feed both marine fish and uh, freshwater fish. Well, um, the main difference between freshwater and marine fish when it comes to diet is their ability to uh, process and synthesize fatty acids. So when we're talking about fatty acids, we, call, we say EFAs, essential fatty acids. And within that group of EFAs, there's two subgroups. One's PUFAs, uh, highly unsaturated fatty acids, and then another one's PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the difference between marine and freshwater is freshwater can basically take any one of those fatty acid types and they can get it into their system, they can break it down and they can synthesize whatever other fatty acid they need in case the one you provided wasn't exactly the right one. Marine fish don't have that ability. Uh, marine fish have to, uh, cannot synthesize hoofas, the highly unsaturated fatty acids. They cannot synthesize those. They have to be supplied to them. So when you look at the difference between a freshwater diet and a, and a marine diet, um, if the manufacturer has done their research and they are providing a good quality formula, they have the correct fatty acid component for a marine animal within a marine diet that you could feed an, in a prepared food. Single animal foods are a little different, but in a prepared food, uh, like a can of flake or a pellet, um, a marine, at least on cobalt, if, if you see a marine fish on the label, like this is our mysospirulina, we have a cichlid on there and we also have some tangs and an angel. Uh, if there is a marine animal on there, you could feed that food 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365, as a sole diet to that tank and that, that animal, and that animal would thrive and do well on as, just with that food because it has a full complement of ingredients and it has a complete fatty acid profile that a marine or freshwater fish needs. If it does not have a marine animal on it, say like our tropical flake or our color flake, I think as well, uh, our goldfish flake for sure, uh, that did not, we do not add the extra fatty acid component to the formula. And it's not necessarily a bad food to feed to a marine animal as part of a complete regimen that you do. Say if you're feeding mice shrimp along with a flake, along with some other frozen item or something else, it's a good adder, especially the color one, because you'll get all those astaxanthins and things. But if right. you add it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you would malnourish that fish and eventually it would die uh, because okay. you're not supplying everything it needs. Uh, but as a, as a specialty diet, as an accessory diet, um, say like color food or color pellets, great, great thing to feed, uh, like as a treat or as, as part of a complete diet. Okay. But just not as a sole diet on its own because of their inability to produce those fatty acids yes. without it. Now, now I'm fresh and can you feed, so can you feed, uh, any, uh, freshwater formula to a marine fish? Yes, you can just make sure that it's part of a complete diet. Can you feed a marine formula? to a freshwater, absolutely. You're just probably paying more than you need because the marine diets cost more to make. They're a little more expensive at the shelf. And so you're supplying the food, the animal, like a flame and yang when it only needs hamburger. Gotcha. So here's a question that uh, I wanted to pose to you. If you had one single piece of advice when it came to fish nutrition, 
for just your average uh, aquarium owner. So maybe somebody who's just getting into aquariums for their first time or just has one in their living room for their family or whatever, not necessarily a hardcore hobbyist, but just a general piece of information. Uh, what would you give to that, that aquarium owner? It's a really good question. Uh, I don't think everybody's asked me that before. Yay! Uh, <laughs> um, I'd say uh, if you if you're just getting into it, uh, probably the the number one thing I would say is if you if you haven't bought a tank already, uh, make sure you buy the biggest tank that you can afford and have room for. Um, water quality is the number one thing that we're concerned about in the fish tank. And the larger the water volume is, the easier it's going to be for you to maintain. A lot of people think a larger tank is harder to keep because they just think they're kind of intimidated by the size. But the larger the water volume, the slower things happen chemically within the tank. So if you can, if you can afford a 55 gallon tank, get a 55 gallon tank instead of a 29. Uh, it's just, it's going to be much better for you. And as far as nutrition plays into that, whatever, uh, like a dog, when you feed, feed a dog cheap, you know, like Walmart old Roy food, or you feed it, say, I'm something like that, something that's a much higher quality, you can Uber or something. Uh, you, you notice that they don't poop as much because the nutrition is much better. But when you're worried about your dog going to the bathroom, it goes out to the yard and it poops out in the grass and you don't really have to deal with it at all. You know, if you don't want to, um, unless you happen to step in it, uh, but you can live it out there and you can leave it out there for months and months. It doesn't matter. It's just going to stay out there. And the, the, the animal doesn't have to deal with it either, but whatever you feed a fish, when they digest it and it leaves their body in its waste, it stays in that five panes of glass, that glass box you're keeping them in there until you remove it. So you, any, the food is critically more important to feed, what type of food to feed a fish than it is, say, another type of animal, a dog or a cat, because they're living in the environment that they're also doing their business in. So you, you need to be very cognizant of that. And that ties right into the size of the tank as well. So the smaller water volume, if you overfeed or the fish is pooping a lot and you're not keeping up with the maintenance, the, you're going to have pH and alkalinity problems very quickly. Your nitrates are going to rise, um, potentially have... Um, temperature issues really easily. A larger tank, it's a lot harder for that tank to heat up and cool down. So once it gets to temperature, it's going to stay at temperature. And then in the, the deep, there's just a lot more water. So the alkalinity and the pH are going to be a lot more stable. That's awesome. That's fantastic, actually. Great answer. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask <laughs> I'm going to ask a couple other questions uh, that I've got here. I took the liberty of making sure I wrote them down so I would not forget what I wanted to ask you. Um, when it comes to fish nutrition uh, within a species, let's say we're dealing just with one species, does their nutrition change over time? So let's say we get a, a young fish from a uh, our local Big Al store or, and we've got that fish as a baby, as it grows, as it goes through its life changes, as it starts to breed, uh, as it gets into the uh, the end of its life stages. Should its diet change at all, or should we be feeding the same food from point A all the way to point Z? So in general, the nutrition requirements don't change that much, but the amount of food potentially does over time. Um, with that said, should you, um, should you be serving the same food at the beginning or feeding at the beginning at the end? Uh, as we mentioned earlier, fish really do like a variety. So you should be trying to vary at least the flavors of the food over, you know, daily if, or, you know, weekly, if not something to keep it interesting and keep that nutritional profile kind of mixed up. Um, but as far as stages in the life, um, you definitely, when, when they're, if, the, if you do get them as a fry, if you're a breeder and as a fry, uh, a lot of fish will not be able to eat a prepared food as a fry because they're just too small. So, you, you know, depending on the size of the, of, the, of the fish that you actually get, um, if they're truly, truly a baby, talking tiny, you might have to feed like microworms or freshly hatched brine at that time uh, or, or a fry food, which is a very, very tiny micro pellet or even a crushed flake. Um, but then as the fish grows and they're able to handle larger diets, you can switch over to a flake. And at the as they're growing, um, depending on how fast you want them to color, uh, the more color enhancing foods you can feed them, the faster they're gonna color. If you just feed them a general diet, um, then without a lot of color enhancer, the color will come eventually and it'll come at more of a controlled or natural, natural space. Um, and if you're trying to breed them, um, a higher protein, higher fat content diet during that time will help condition the fish and you'll get much larger uh, gamete production. So eggs and sperm production will be up. Um, so if you, and there's, there's all sorts of uh, 
old wives tales, if you will, from old school breeders of using egg flake or uh, beef heart or black worms or things like that. And our pro breeder has all that in there as well. Um, so if you want to try to condition them, then for that, then, you know, a different diet during that time or really intense protein feeding and fat feeding uh, to breed is a good thing. As a fish ages and they're not necessarily in breeding condition anymore, uh, but you want to keep them healthy, um, you know, if you want them to be very colored up, a color diet's great, um, or just a standard flake or a pellet would be fine at the end. Um, but awesome. awesome. Makes Fantastic. sense? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it does yeah, yeah, actually. It does actually. You know, it's just funny because I've, I've actually had that question posed to me as well, based on the fact that somebody had a dog and there's different diets for dogs along their life cycle. And they asked, you know, what would be appropriate for their, their fish that they had had for like 15 years. And I was like, well, you know, as long as you've got a good, varied diet going on, it, it should be the same thing. I don't think a fish's diet changes that much, but I know you guys specialize in nutrition. So I wanted to just get your take on it as well. Um, if you had to pick three foods from your line to act as an all encompassing diet for a community tropical tank, what three foods would you pick? Uh, well, tropical would have to be in there for sure. Um, that's our base flake. Um, and then from there, color, I think would be a good one to add, uh, because you want, you want the reds, oranges and yellows to pop and that has our highest acid xanthan level. And then, uh, for a third, um, probably, I was going to pick one out of all the flavors, probably our Mysis Spirulina blend. Um, that, that we, we're one of the very few companies that actually make a Mysis flake and it's a Canadian Mysis that we put into it. And it's a 40, 40, 20 blend in that formula where it's 40% Mysis flake, 40% Spirulina flake, and then 20% blue flake, which is our, one of our signature things that we do is we put 20% of the blue flake or pellet in every one of our blends. Um, and the Mysis flake and the Spirulina, have a very unique uh, nutritional profile that I think would be a great, uh, uh, great addition to that uh, uh, tropical and color diet for a community tank. Right on. And uh, our blue flake, uh, just because I touched on that, I don't think we've mentioned that the blue flake actually is a special formula. It's our tropical base flake, but then we go in and add triple the amount of vitamins and immunostimulants that we put into our general diet. And so every time they get that blue flake and, and they eat that one, it's like getting their Flintstone vitamin pack for the day. It's a, it's an extra little vitamin boost. And we could have just done it and put a higher level into all of our flakes. Uh, but the, we decided since our name's cobalt, we, we would do a cobalt blue flake uh, as kind of our signature item and make a little, little bit of a marketing gimmick out of the nu nutritionally sound information now. That, that's there so that it's not the the marketing of the blue flake is is the gimmick but the addition of vitamins and amino stimulants is absolutely critical we think in the formula right on uh so I'm, we're gonna get some more of these questions answered that i just found sorry guys if i don't see them right away i get pretty involved in uh, listening to our speakers and sometimes uh they pass me by but brian's usually pretty diligent at making sure i go back and check them so um We've got another one from Vashish Kumar. What's the best color enhancing food for guppies? I'm going to go out on a limb and assume it's going to be the color formula that we've been talking about. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, um, guppies, guppies are a pretty easy fish to feed. Yeah. And if you're just, if you're trying to color enhance, uh, color enhancing would be great. Yep. Right on. And then for, um, we've got one from uh, Jessica looks like I'm looking for a food for my strictly herbivore fish, AKA my auto cat Melvin. Oh, he's got a name. That's awesome. So uh, what would you guys suggest for a strictly herbivore diet for something like an auto cat or pleco or? Um, well, the important thing to realize is even though fish are considered herbivores, they're not really truly uh, herbivores. 99% of the time, they're really more of an omnivore that has a more herbivore tendency. So if you're looking for a pure vegetable formula, you're probably really not going to find it. So what you want to do is try to find one that is a vegetable uh, geared food. So if you're, if you're, if you want to, if you're thinking, I'm going to tell you, go get a herbivore food and you turn around and look on it and there's salmon meal or a krill meal or something in there like that. Uh, we're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. It's that fish are very opportunistic. And if, especially like a catfish, if they're going around grazing and they come across uh, amphipod or cocopod, they're going to eat it if they can. Um, so with that, um, our spirulina, uh, formula would be great. Either that or our algae wafers, uh, or another great item. Our algae wafer diet has, um, some incredible like garden, like ingredients, watercress, celery, things like that in there to enhance that vegetable protein and increase the fiber component. So for animals that like plecos are things that need that extra bit of plant fiber that comes from the cell walls, 
uh, of the plant that they're eating or the wood that they're eating in, in, in nature. Uh, all that extra uh, vegetable meals and powders and, and ingredients that we put in there have that extra cellulose from the cell walls uh, that are included in that diet. Fantastic. That, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely uh, awesome. Um, another question I've been asked several times over the years that I figured I'd pose, um, when somebody's trying to change a fish's diet over from something like a flake, cause it's pretty easy to get fish on a flake. It's a food that's once it's in their mouth, they tend to just keep it there. It's not a, a hard food. So I find they, they have no problem eating it. Getting some of those fish switched over to something like a pellet can be difficult. Uh, what, what do you guys suggest if somebody's trying to switch their fish's diet over from something like a flake over to a pellet for whatever reason, uh, sometimes cichlids get bigger and people are tired of dumping fistfuls of flake in, or they figure that pellets going to, uh, relate to, or directly translate to less waste because less is falling to the bottom and getting lost in the gravel, et cetera. Uh, how would you guys suggest convincing a fish to maybe switch over from a flake to a pellet or maybe even pellet to flake, et cetera? Well, there's a couple different, uh, ways to do it. Um, one is just to be realized if you are switching from a flake to a pellet, you're going from a relatively fluffy, uh, very, very light, not very dense food to a very compact, dense food. So uh, the pellet has a lot more nutrition packed into a lot smaller package than a flake does. So it's very easy to overfeed. So if you're not, if you're not used to feeding a pellet, maybe get a little scale and, or, you know, just feel how much flake you're doing when you grab that pinch of flake versus how much you grab when you do a pinch of pellets. It's a lot more food. So just be cautious with that. Um, with that, if they are uh, showing uh, signs that they're not wanting to switch over, um, soaking a pellet can help. Um, that will soften out that the, the form factor of it. Um, and it'll make it easier for the fish to put into their mouth when they get it in there. It doesn't feel, you know, as alien as would if you just put it in really dry and, and fresh. So soaking it for a minute or two, uh, depending on the brand and, and the type of pellet they're using, kind of keep an eye on it so you don't soak it too long so it just turns into mush. Um, you want to just soak it enough so that it that it softens up so it, it's uh, softer and uh, less um, easier on the sensitive parts of the mouth uh, of the fish. Um, so that's one thing you can do. The second thing is and if you're soaking, um, you could put an appetite stimulant in there uh, to do it. There's a bunch of available out of the market. That'll help uh, build up that attractiveness of it. Typically they have things like garlic or tuna oil or things in them that uh, smell really good to the fish. And if it's like, you know, sprinkling sugar on top, they, they smell it and they want to come after it. Um, that's another trick. The other one is feed just a sparingly amount of the flake and then supplement uh, once they get into that frenzy and they're starting eating, uh, then you put in the pellet second, um, then they're kind of already in that mode and they're not thinking about it. They're just twirling around hitting anything that's in the water. Uh, so that's a good trick. Um, another way uh, is if uh, every fish will eat live brine. So you go get a little bit of live brine uh, for the day or, you know, a few and sprinkle just a bit of live brine to create that frenzy and then pop the pellets in, in at the same time as the brine. Again, it gets them into that frenzy. And the third one, uh, non-fish keepers or new fish keepers might think it sounds a little cruel, uh, but it absolutely isn't. It's not a big deal typically is take them off feed for one or two days and uh, get them hungry and then go ahead and feed them uh, again with a pellet. And normally that'll do it as well. Uh, but be patient. Uh, most foods, uh, fish, fish in general want to eat. Um, they're not going to stick their nose up to something if they're hungry. Um, so that they're, it, they will go on to basically any diet at, at some point. Right on. Yeah. And you know what, to, to, to speak a little bit towards, um, giving fish a time to get hungry, uh, before you, you try to feed it has worked really well. Uh, for me personally in the past, switching uh, fish over to a pellet diet, just simply because as they grow sometimes, especially when you're dealing with species that get a lot larger, uh, as they grow flake becomes almost just too difficult to feed because you have to feed so much of it to that one large fish in order to, to meet their, uh, demand. So having those couple days off, uh, the longest I've ever had to do it was about five days of, of no food. Uh, it makes a big difference. The fish has to be hungry. Obviously you don't want to try and do that with a fish who hasn't eaten in a long time already. If that's the case, definitely look into something, uh, you know, there's gotta be something going on with the fish. Fish usually only stop eating if there's something going on with them, if they're ill, um, something to that effect. Yeah. But yeah, no, like I've had wild caught fish that I've had come in that will eat live, no problem. And uh, give them a few days off of food. 
and just stand back and toss a couple little pellets or some flake into the tank. And they'll be more interested then than they were the few days before when they were already full from you feeding live the previous day or the previous uh, set of hours. So um, a big component to that is switching to is, is really the ch- food you're choosing. Um, so in our foods, when we, when I develop a formula, I have my three strike rule that I call it. Um, the, and it's a backwards baseball analogy. It's not three strikes and you're out, it's three strikes and you're in. Uh, so the, the first strike is that we want it to be very attractive. Uh, so when it hits the water, we want it, the fish to smell it. We want them to sense it and they, they want to come investigate. It just can't, it's like the steak on the grill. They can smell that steak cooking and they, uh, the smoke coming off the grill and they're going to come running after it. Uh, so that's a first strike. So whenever we're doing a new formula, when that hit, when that hits the water, the fish have to be interested. The second is once they're there, it has to be uh, smell good enough, look good enough that they want to put it in their mouth. So that's a palatability part. And then the third part is the nutrition has to be absolutely correct for whatever we're doing in that formula. So all of our foods, those first two strikes are exactly what we're talking about. When you're switching over, um, you need a food that has a really good smell and a really good high palatability rating on it. And you want it to be nutri- nutritionally sound. But as long as it has those attractants in it, Again, it's like tuna oil, garlic, uh, actually paprika is a very good uh, fish attractant. Uh, we put a little bit of paprika in all of our formulas as well. That's another color enhancing item. Uh, but fish love paprika for some reason. Um, but that those things will all help the fish eat for the first time. And one thing uh, also mentioning not feeding, um, if you're getting your fish fresh in, uh, say you go to your big owl store and, you know, they just got their fish in and you're getting it right away. Um, if you're trying to get it to feed, um, and it's not eating your prepared food, like you mentioned, get it on live food, uh, at least in the beginning, uh, to make sure it's eating because fish suppliers typically will take fish off feed anywhere from 24 to 48 hours prior to shipment, uh, because they want to keep the amount of waste down in the bags and increase the water quality level as best they can during that overnight shipment from say Florida or wherever they're grown up to wherever the store is that they're shipping them to. So, Fresh new fish in a store probably haven't eaten for one or two days if you buy them the day they get there. Uh, so if they're not eating right away your prepared food, definitely get them on something live. Get them, get them eating something uh, right away. It's going to help them out tremendously. Right on. You know, we've talked a lot about the different aspects of uh, your cobalt foods, what you guys put in them, uh, how those things work. But uh, Brian actually just asked the best question. Uh of the day, I think, which is what makes cobalt aquatics foods stand out from everything else on the shelf, other than that wicked cool black packaging with the colored tops. Thank you. Since the packaging is my department, that's as well. That's great. I appreciate that. High five, buddy. <laughs> uh, well, one thing we, uh, like I mentioned, our three strike rule, that's, um, we are very, we're all fish geeks. Um, I started in the hobby basically when I was born. Uh, my dad had discus way back in the early 70s, and I took the tanks over when I was like five or six. I have a degree in aquatic biology, and I worked as a research biologist uh, for about just under eight years at Marineland uh, Aquarium Products. And then I went from there uh, into the marketing side of things with Marineland, Instant Ocean, Tetra, Jungle Aquarium Products. And I left, I was a director of marketing uh, for the equipment and consumables group. Um, and then I, I realized that, that that business anymore was more about business. It wasn't not about being a fish geek anymore. And so that's when I decided to leave to start Cobalt. So when we left and started Cobalt, uh, we started the company um, to be fish, uh, the company for fish geeks by fish geeks. So we're taking all that information, all that life experience that I have working for the big boys and putting that and my fish geek roots um, to the point that I even my license plate sees in the fish geek. Um, and putting that into every can that we, every product that we make. Um, so our foods are as geeked out as they possibly can uh, from a technical side for the laws of the U S uh, we don't worry about exporting out outward uh, into any other countries uh, except for Canada, obviously. And uh, we do a little bit into Mexico, uh, but we don't worry about exporting into Europe or anywhere else because the nutrition laws and the ingredient laws are very different there. And we would have to dumb our formula way down to be able to export it. Um, so our formula is tricked out as much as it possibly can. And that's from the proteins that we use, the, uh, the fatty acids that we put in, uh, the amino acid complexes that we make sure that are in there, uh, the vitamins and minerals that we put in. I mentioned the blue flake, for instance. We're really the only ones that are putting in extra vitamins and amino stimulants into the food to make sure that the fish are good within those five planes of glass. 
Uh, most nutrition studies and most of nutrition work that's been done on fish is done either in the wild or in aquaculture environments where you're not worried about really uh, keeping the fish in top shape and top color. They're just looking to see what grows the fish uh, from fry to plate as fast as they can in aquaculture, or they're just doing gut analysis of what the fish might be eating in the wild. That all changes when you put it into a confined five panes of glass. There still are the needs. The, there's still the proteins and the fats, amino acids, vitamins and minerals that you need. And you need to have that. And that, that research all comes into play. But then we add the wants. What, what do we want as fish geeks to have the food do and how the fish perform on the food in that five panes of glass? And we take that approach a little differently than, than other companies. Um, so the, the immuno stimulants I mentioned, um, we're really the, uh, one of the very few companies that puts that level of immuno stimulants in there. And we do three, we, uh, the main one or four main ones, spearline algae actually is a great amino stimulant garlic, which is a amino stimulant. It's a triple threat ingredient for us. It's a amino stimulant. It's an appetite stimulant and it's a great antioxidant. Uh, so garlic's a great component to that. Um, we also use uh, two exotic ones, beta glucan and kytosan. Um, and beta glucan is a, a very specific ingredient that we put in um, that we've done a lot of work with our suppliers on researching on how it affects the immune response and the immune uh, by stimulating what we call neutrophils, which are like basically white blood cells. So how active and how many white blood cells are these neutrophils are swimming around in the bot in the bloodstream of the fish um, can vary depending on how much like beta glucan we put in there. And when I say amino stimulant, it, it's amino stimulants, an ingredient that we put into the food to trick the immune system to acting at a higher level. Um, so or, like if you're traveling in the airport and you know you're going through TSA security, uh, you know the, there's normal just TSA employees. If there's no threat around, if somebody calls in a bomb threat or some terrorist activity happens, now all of a sudden the threat level goes up. There's more security guards. There might even be National Guard or Army guys standing there with M16s. Security's levels up. Well, what we do with immunostimulants is that we increase that level of of those neutrophils to the point where they're much more active uh, on a day-to-day -day basis by basically tricking it into thinking that there's a pathogen in the system where there is really no pathogen. Um, so we can see tremendous levels um, difference in the neutrophils uh, activity just by doing the beta glucan. So, so on that basic basic rate, rate, transistor, transistor resilient, resilient. Yeah. So it's, it's just stronger, stronger, stronger immune system in general because of that. Yes. And it keeps, you know, keeps their tendency to get diseases down. Um, so anytime you're living in a confined, confined space, if you're stuck in your office, you know, for 50 or 60 hours a week, cause it's really big, busy and it's a tight office and somebody comes in that's sick and they're sneezing and coughing all over the place. Just think if you're a fish, if somebody comes in and is sick and you're in a fish tank, you know, just like your office, there's nowhere to go. You got to be there. So you're going to go get vitamin C. You're going to be drinking orange juice or whatever you do, your vitamins uh, to keep, try to keep from getting sick from that person. We're doing the same thing in the fish tank with immunostimulants. stimulants. Uh, keeping the immune system up and, ha and uh, going as fast as we can uh, to keep those fish healthy in, in a very in a stressful world of that five panes of glass. Uh, let's get to Grant's question. Um, Grant says, I have a black piranha that accepts some pellets right now. He doesn't seem to be attracted to smaller pellets. Do you have anything that rivals Massivore or Biogold, three millimeter or under, even though he's only four inches, he won't touch? So he's not interested in three millimeter or less pellets. What do you have, uh, if anything, in your cobalt lineup that he might be able to use for his finicky black piranha? Is it a piranha or arowana? Piranha. Piranha. Black okay. piranha. So bigger, bigger species of piranha, I believe. Um, all of, uh, for a three millimeter, we have uh, only two sizes of pellets. Our standard uh, 16th of an inch. I'm sorry, it's not millimeters. And I can't remember the conversion off the top of my head. Um, 16th of an inch is our, our normal pellet. And then our larger pellet is an eighth of an inch in diameter. Um, so our cichlid pellet would be our largest. Um, all of our pellets are uniquely formulated compared to other ones that are out there. We actually start with our flake and we grind the flake into a powder. And then we take that powder and we add a little bit more water back to it and a little more oil to make a paste. And then we re-extrude it and then low heat dry it in a dehydrator uh, and to form the pellet. So the pellet actually is very, very dense, uh, very, very potent, uh, but it's the same exact formula as our flake. But with that density, it sinks like a rock. Um, so it, it's very, very negatively buoyant. So that's why I wasn't sure if you said arowana or piranha. Uh, for an arowana, uh, our food, our pellets are probably not the best choice because they're right. more 
Marcus Feeder, uh, but Piranha, they'll, they'll eat really anywhere. So uh, if you're looking for a bigger pellet, we the largest we make is an eighth of an inch. Uh, but the good thing about our pellets is that because they're that powder, we did that very specifically uh, because we wanted it to be easier for the fish to masticate, like chew up, um, so that they wouldn't get big chunks of or just swallow the pellets whole and then have them blow it up in the gut. Because a normal pellet will swell. Uh, our right. pellets, as they get more moisture in it, um, they just soften up. And then when the fish gets it into their pharyngeal teeth, um, now piranha do have obviously teeth in the front, but all fish have like molars, basically. They're in the back of the throat. They're called pharyngeal teeth. And they're bony plates that they rub together and the food gets in, in between and they'll rub it and then they'll crush it with those. And our foods will break apart into a very, very fine pieces really easy and make them easy to digest. Um, so well, I guess the answer is we, eighth of an inch is the largest one we make in our cichlid large. And that may not be big enough for what he wants, but that's what we have. But what, you're, 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 what we did talk about earlier is that food uh, does have a bunch of extra, getting a bit of an echo on my, my apologies, uh, have a bunch of extra uh, stimulants in it um, that may aid in your piranha's uh, desire to uh, actually take that food in and digest it, even though it's smaller. Because um, the way a food smells, uh, which Les was talking about earlier, um, the way a food feels inside their mouth is going to change how that fish responds to the food. So it may be worth a try to even just get a smaller uh, container of that cichlid pellet, see if your piranha uh, appreciates it. Uh, Cause if they do, even it might not just be a size issue. They may, it, it might be that your piranha doesn't want to take those other foods because not only is it maybe not as palatable to that spe uh, specific fish, but the size is not even attractive at that point. So that could be the deterrent. There's no harm in trying. Well, this has been so far a fantastic blab. I don't know if uh, there's anything less you want to uh, give us in closing from your end before I go through my little spiel of things that I need to list off. Um, so yeah, you've got the floor for a moment. Please do something with it. Well, in general, um, I think go back to your question that you put me on the spot on is um, get the biggest tank that you can afford and realize that the fish food that you're putting into your tank is going to stay in your tank until you take it out as waste and it's going to affect your water quality. So buy the best quality food that you can, you can and feed your fish the best and uh, more often in less smaller quantities at each time is going to be better for the majority of fish out there. And uh, remember our, uh, we're fish geeks um, have been in the industry forever and have been hobbyists and are still hobbyists to this day. And we're making everything we can, uh, everything we do is to make a product that is going to help the hobbyists succeed uh, the best that they can to the best of our ability as manufacturers. Um, so our foods with the, the 20% of the blue flake with, with the triple uh, dose of vitamins and immunostimulants is going to keep the fish uh, immune system and their health as, as best as it can be. Um, adding in the probiotics, which is fairly unique to us. We're really the pioneers of using probiotics in, in fish food and the hobby. Um, that's going to help their digestion. You're going to end up with a faster growth rate, uh, like I said, up to 12% in angels um, in studies that have been done, and you'll have less waste. Um, so a couple a good quality nutritional profile with extra vitamins and immunostimulants to help the health. And then the probiotics, there is just, uh, in my opinion, there's not a better food out there that you could be feeding. Um, but if you're a marine guy, remember the fatty acids, that's really what you're concerned about. You want to make sure you have a higher protein, higher fatty acid level, and the correct amount of hoofas and poofas for it because they can't resynthesize all the fatty acids. Uh, again, if you're looking at our foods, if you're a marine, if it has a marine food on it, you could feed that marine food as a sole diet every day and it, it would do great on it. If it doesn't, it needs, it's a, it may be a great accessory diet, but feed it uh, as a part of a complete nutritional profile. Awesome. Um, we actually have one more question I want to, to uh, sure. get to right before we take off here. Um, Cause like I said, unfortunately I'm not the best at following this and I sometimes check late. Um, Big trouble. NJ said, don't know if you already answered this, but uh, what kind of food should I feed my tropical and quarry fish? Uh, so tropical tropical diet would be great for that. Um, our flake foods in general are easier to feed for most people. Um, as long as you're putting enough in there, they get down to the bottom. The quarries will eat that up, no problem. Um, if your quarries are not as aggressive at coming out and feeding or you're doing a very good job of uh, keeping the food content low uh, when you're feeding, uh, you might want to augment with a pellet. Um, and put a few pellets in the bottom so they can go down and chew on it. Our algae wafers are another great thing for quarries to come and chew on if they if they like as well. 
Right on. But a good mix of trop- blend of tropical color. And I, you asked me for the three that I would recommend if you were going to do any. Tropical color and probably the Mysis Spirulina would be a great compliment for that tank. Fantastic. And um, just out of my own curiosity, when it comes to quarry catfish, do you uh, do you prefer feeding a flake and allowing it to sink or feeding a sinking pellet? Um, for most people, I would still recommend the flake because it's very it's very difficult to overfeed a flake to the point where you're going to cause yourself trouble in an aquarium. That's one of the great things about a flake. A little bit of flake looks like a giant mess if the fish the fish aren't eating it. Uh, a, too much pellets uh, doesn't look like anything in a tank, especially sinking pellets. And you can cause a lot of water quality issues very easily. So for most people feeding a little extra flake and just rather not just sprinkle it on the top and let it float around, but just take your finger and push it under the water level, uh, then it's gonna go, it's gonna flow around the tank a lot quicker. Um, don't be afraid of putting your, fish, your fingers in the tank. It's normally not a big deal. And by doing that, the, the flakes are typically neutrally buoyant, so they're going to go all over the place and event- and maybe slightly negative and eventually get to the bottom. But if you just sprinkle it on the top, the surface tension in most aquariums is going to keep the food up there. It's not going to fall down uh, very easily, especially if you have like a small canister filter or canister filter where you're not agitating the surface very much. Um, so uh, a flake um, augment with a s- small amount of pellets if they're not getting it down not getting down there far enough or quick enough for the quarries and don't be afraid to put your finger in the tank and switch that flake around when you feed right on thank you so much les it is important not to forget that cobalt doesn't just do fish food um cobalt does all kinds of aquatic products they have a fantastic line of products they've got products that i don't even see from other companies things like uh for for cichlid nuts or fish breeders out there the egg tumbler huge who else does an egg, egg tumbler like nobody they also have the breeding cone, which is incredibly popular. Uh, great for those who are breeding angelfish, cichlids, any any kind of fish that wants to lay on on a uh, uh, surface like that. It works really well. I've seen it in use. Um, they also have a fantastic line of original maxi jet pumps. These are the, the ones from. Uh, are they from Europe? Is that where they come from? Yeah, Italy. Yeah, they're the old maxi jets. We call them the MJs. Can't call them the maxi. Right. Obviously, the original MJs, and they're made in Italy. Yep. Perfect. There you go. So I name dropped. He's not allowed to, but I can do whatever I want. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My uh, favorite product from them probably that I'm using right now is their line of canister filters. Um, They have the EXT canister. It is probably the easiest canister for anybody to work with. The best part is if you use it with a pump in the aquarium, as opposed to uh, outside of the aquarium, the thing self primes and it's, it's incredibly easy to do maintenance on. It's uh, one of the only, or probably the only thing I've ever seen with a um, disconnect valve that recirculates water. It turns it into a closed loop rather than shutting the water off. So your your tank doesn't go without circulation while you're working on your uh, canister. For those of you who don't know it, we actually have a video review of that canister filter and how to set it up. So if you'd like to see that, I'm sure I can get uh, Brian here to drop a link uh, down below. Once again, Les, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm sure we'll have Cobalt back for a future talk, uh, whether it's on filtration or or uh, any other number of uh, aspects of our hobby. If you guys ever have any suggestions for a blab for the future, some topic that you'd like us to talk about, please reach out to us. We love your suggestions. Uh, that's really what this is all about, is getting information to you hobbyists and uh, newer fish keepers that need this information. This is why we do it. I mean, if, if we wanted uh, to just gab to ourselves, I would just invite uh, Les over here and he'd gladly come and we'd just sit in this uh, boardroom and have a chat all geeked out by ourselves. Uh, but that doesn't exactly benefit <laughs> everybody else, which is what we really want to do because these talks that we have in private uh, fairly regularly, every time I see you guys in, in the uh, building, we, we stop and talk. These are great conversations to have out in the open and Blab's a great tool for it. So we're hoping to have you guys guys back and that's it thank you so much Les once again for coming so glad to have you here always a pleasure you're a wealth of knowledge especially when it comes to fish nutrition it absolutely blows my mind how much you've uh, stored up there (laughs) thank you for that compliment thank you for having me on and anytime you want us back be happy to join you awesome all right guys that's it for now I'm going to uh see you later Les so take care Okay, guys, we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you. Over and out.